Hi, good evening and welcome to episode two of drgreg.vet. We are here to bring you credible information about your pet's health. So today I am gonna discuss with you one of the um, topics that I discuss most as a veterinarian and, and an internal medicine specialist. There's not, doesn't matter what disease process uh, I'm diagnosing and treating, at some point during the discussion, nutrition comes up. The owners want to know, my dog has been diagnosed with kidney disease or diabetes or pancreatitis or whatever the case is, how is that going to change what they should eat? So, and, and this, is, this is probably the most confusing area of veterinary medicine, even for veterinarians. So what I want to do is I want to start, you know, and we'll talk about basically what to feed your pet and i'm not going to make any specific recommendations i'm going to help you decide how to pick that what you feel is best for them to eat i'll give you information um, that will help you go to a pet food store go online and and find the best food that that the what you think is the best food for your pet um, and then i, I want to talk about who you should listen to in regards to advice about how to feed your pet. There's a lot of information both on the internet and and there are people, you know, that call themselves veterinary nutritionists. Um, and I want to help you easily and quickly break down who are the people you should really be listening to. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to feed your pet, the specifics on when to offer them food, how to offer them food what to do if they don't feel like eating. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, problems with your pet's eating habits and when we should decide it's really a problem uh, and when you should do something about it and what. So first of all, what should you feed your pet? Uh, when I walk into a pet food store these days and I walk through the aisles, I'm astonished at the number of foods on the shelves. Um, when I'm talking to clients and I ask what they're feeding their pet, they'll come up with a name of a food I've never heard of and just assume that I know what, what it is. And I don't because things change fairly rapidly. What I personally recommend to almost all of my owners is, is that stick with the bigger manufacturers. And, and I'm not just, I, I, I don't get paid by any food companies. I never have. I just like the big manufacturers, the Purinas, the Yukonubas, the Hills, you know, those type of, of, of companies because it is actually proven in the veterinary literature that the larger companies have, have superior, have better quality control. And I think that's what we're all looking for is consistent food that we can buy a bag in Naples, Florida, and then we could buy a bag in Seattle, Washington, and they're going to be exactly the same food. They may have been, and they probably have been manufactured in different plants, but they're the same food. There's good quality control. There are a lot of boutique foods out there, and, and there's probably nothing wrong with a lot of them, um, but it we do know that their quality control is not poor, is what I'm saying. It's just that the larger manufacturers have more means to have better quality control. A little step back about, about me. Um, I have owned a lot of dogs in the last, you know, 30 years of my, my life. I have, I, um, I have English Springer Spaniels, specifically field bred English Springer Spaniels. And, um, I hunt with them. I do do that. I bird hunt with them. It's one of my passions outside of work. I field trial with them, compete with them, and and so I've had I've I've had a lot of dogs in my life, and for the last 23 years, I have fed uh, exclusively Prina Pro Plan uh, dog food, and in that time, I I don't know. I probably fed you know 20 or 30 dogs that food. They've all done extremely well. You know, so I'm not saying that, you know, are, are specifically recommending that you should all switch your dogs to pro plan. 
just find a food that works for them and and keeps them happy and healthy and don't stress about it too much it's something i do from time to time i'll get a wild hair and decide i should switch you know the type of protein or carbohydrate you know maybe i can make my dog's coat look better or whatever the case is but i pretty much always come back to the you know feeding the same old food because they do extremely well on it. So if your dog is doing well, um, stay stay with that food. Probably the biggest piece of advice I can give you is, is to stick with the food that is AFCO, A-A-F-C-O, which is the American, or the Association of American Feed Control Officials. It is an organization that works with federal and state agencies and, and helps maintain guidelines for um, you know, whatever area of the country you live in, maintains the guidelines um, to, to make sure that, you know, the food that you're feeding your pet, uh, you know, is, is well balanced and, and safe. And so make sure if you, you do pick a food that um, it is AFCO certified, that that's an important thing. And you can usually find that on, on the bag or the box or the can, usually on the back label near the bottom, it'll, it'll discuss you know, being AFCO certified. So, um, so where should you get your information? If, if your pet isn't doing well, you've tried several foods and they're maybe it, they have allergies or they have, you know, gastrointestinal upset or they don't eat well, you know, who, who can you, who should you get advice from? when you're looking for someone to take advice from when you when you reach that point that you you need advice from a specialist make sure that they have acvn after their name dvm doctor of veterinary medicine first of all and then acvn and which means they're a diplomat at the american college of veterinary nutrition and pretty rigorous training and it doesn't matter where they were trained they're all excellent and, and, and knowledgeable. So now there aren't that many nutritionists out there. So you probably don't have one in your neighborhood or your county, maybe even your state. So what can you do if you say, you know, I, I really, I'd like to make a home cooked diet for my dog. I want to make sure it's well balanced. I want to make sure it's treating his, his allergies appropriately or his, his gastrointestinal disease but I don't have anyone in town that they can really help me with what I need. There's an excellent website that um, it is run by boarded veterinary nutritionists called balanceit.com, um, so, uh, B-A-L-A-N-C-E-I-T.com. And it is a very interactive website. Your pet doesn't have to have a medical condition. You just have to have an interest in making a home cooked diet or you can actually ask the nutritionist questions through the website and, and they can potentially make recommendations about commercially available diets that would be, you know, appropriate for your pet's needs. So, um, but balanceit.com um, is, is an excellent resource. If you're looking to work with an individual, your, your vet, your veterinarian can, can send in a referral. Most of the, most of the major veterinary schools have nutrition programs. Um, some of the big ones are UC Davis, University of Tennessee, Tufts. Um, they generally require referrals. There'll be a pretty extensive form that you and your vet will need to fill out. They'll, they'll email that in and then at some point you'll get a call back from, from the service setting up an appointment uh, so that you can talk to the nutritionist. And it will be an, ext it, we're not talking about a five or 10 minute conversation. Generally, my experience is you're going to talk to the nutritionist for probably an hour and a half or so. Um, they're going to ask lots of questions on every protein you've ever fed your dog. Um, you know, what what happens when they eat certain foods? It, it'll be very, very extensive. And at the end, they'll come up with some diet recommendations. So, so that's who you should be getting your information from. Not everyone needs to do that. Probably, I don't even, I don't have a real number for you. Probably 99 out of 100 pets don't need that service. They just need a good quality food and consistency 
in their diet and they're going to be fine their whole life. But that 1% or that 2 or 3 or 5% that that need more that's that's who I would contact and I'd start with balanceit.com see if that works for you some people find it um you know a little bit too too involved but very few people do um and if if you do find that it's difficult to use too involved or you don't get the information you want then then seek out a consult with a, a board of nutritionist um okay so how to feed your pets I I I can be pretty confident and clear in what I'm saying here. Some of the biggest problems that I see are when people just leave food down all the time for their pets. That that just leads to a lot of problems. Either obese pets or the owners aren't sure if they're eating. You know, they maybe they have more than one dog, they leave the food down. Um, and then it isn't until later that they realize, hey, you know, Fluffy has lost a lot of weight. Is she eating? I don't know. I haven't haven't seen her eat in a while. Maybe I'm not filling the food as much. Plus, if there are, you know, medical conditions later in the pet's life or during the pet's life that that where you really need to meal feed, like say specifically uh, your pet becomes a diabetic, you know, that's a case where that that it really it's necessary for that patient to eat meals during the day at specific times. And, and then really free feeding is not always, you know, the best plan. So, and this is where people get, get kind of, and there's a lot of anxiety over when to feed your pet and how specifically to feed them. A lot of anxiety. Well, I put the food down and he didn't eat. Okay. It's all right. I'm giving you permission. Put the food down. Give them 10 minutes and do this when they're a puppy. Give them 10 minutes. If they don't eat, pick the food up, try again later. And later doesn't mean every five minutes. I mean, if it's a puppy, they need to eat fairly frequently. So you may have to try every couple of hours, offer them food, let them eat what they, they will, but don't leave it down. At that point, pick it up, go on with your life. Don't stress about it. They're going to eat. I promise you this, I, I, I promise you that they're going to eat when they get hungry if it's an older dog and and you're having difficulty put it down for 10 minutes pick it up put it away go to work don't stress about it when you come home put it down you know offer it to them if they don't eat it's actually dogs it's okay if if they go a day without eating i'm not saying i want that to happen free if that's something that's happening frequently we'll talk about this later but maybe you should see your veterinarian, especially if this is a new behavior. But my point is, is get your pet used to meal feeding. And if they, if they miss a meal or two occasionally because they don't feel like eating, it's okay. It's, it's absolutely all right. You're, you're not going to hurt them. Cats, it's really kind of important that they keep eating. So, um, and cats are not really species that, um, it's okay to leave food out for your cats. I still meal feed my cats. They don't eat everything when I, you know, feed them in the morning. They'll still finish it off during the day. Same thing at night, but I still meal feed them. I don't just leave food down all the time. Mostly I want to make sure that I know that they're eating well. Like if they don't happen to come when I'm feeding, I'd like to know the food is gone. They're eating it um, and everything's okay. But I do remember one interesting fact from vet school. Cats are just, they're a species that that feeds intermittently throughout the day. Um, it was Dr. Sawchuk at the University of Wisconsin that said, I think it was on average cats eat about 11 times a day. So, um, <clears throat> and if you have a diabetic cat, we, we can certainly work around a patient. We can, you know, manage a patient that that is, is used to more of a free feeding schedule. But for your dog, I, I do really recommend, you know, getting them on a meal feeding schedule. Sometimes it's hard if you just have one dog. It does have, I mean, I'm not suggesting you go out and buy another dog just for this reason, but you know, if you have a couple of dogs and, and you start to sort of meal feed them like that, they pick up a behavior where they better just eat them and they'll worry the other dog is gonna eat their food if they don't and it kind of drives their appetite. So that's what I recommend. Of course, all of the standard things. I mean, if, you know, I, I would limit, you know, human food, table scraps, specifically table scraps. Um, 
you know, is, is as much as possible because nothing ever good really comes of, of getting, getting, you know, your pet used to, used to eating table scraps and, and, um, yeah, it, it, it leads to a lot of bad habits and, and, and problems later on. So, which you all, I know you know that. So, and then of course, um, you know, we have to touch on, because people ask, what about raw diets? And that's, that's a, 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 an area, I'll say it this way of, you know, where there's a lot of interest right now. You know, there are actually, I did a, I did a literature search this afternoon and looked at what is, what is new in, um, you know, Oh, sorry. The Spaniel nation is, must be somebody at the front door. So, um, you know, a lot of interest in raw diets and, and there's not a lot of research out there. When you look through it, there's research. No one's done any kind of definitive study that I've seen that, that says you should feed a raw diet. You should, I don't recommend. Uh, I don't recommend it strictly from a standpoint of there are studies that it isn't so much that I'm worried about your pet safety. You're feeding them a raw diet. They're going to get food poisoning. There's, there's more data that shows that, you know, if you have children or if you have, you know, grandparents or you have people that are immunocompromised and they don't even always have to, they can be, you know, healthy adults that, that it is more um, what the raw diet's you know, they can infect uh, the people more so than the pets. So I'm, I'm not recommending them. There's a lot, I could do a whole, a whole blog on, on, you know, raw diets and, and review all the literature. And then at the end, you know, give my opinion, but just in general, I, I don't recommend them. There's nothing that proves that they're better for your dog. If your dog does better on one, Okay, just make sure it meets all the criteria that I've already talked talked about. Um, so now, going through all of this, you know how to how to pick a food, pick a pick a high quality food from one of the bigger manufacturers. Make sure that it's AFCO, you know, certified. Look for that on the bag. If you need to, you know, employ the services of a veterinary nutritionist, someone with ACVN, you know, after their name. Um, you know, how to feed your pet, you, you go through the whole process and, and, and your pet still just doesn't eat well, you know, or their appetite is getting more and more poor. You know, maybe they were a good eater and now they're not eating well. What, what should you do? Yes, this is time to go see your veterinarian and, and have a full workup. This, this really isn't, you know, if, if this is a consistent problem, especially if your pet is, is losing weight or, having any GI signs or, you know, maybe is becoming more lethargic. This, this isn't, you know, where I recommend, you know, an antibiotic or an anti-nausea medication, see if things get better, you know, especially if they were a good eater, like, and, and now that's changing, you need a full workup. And what I mean by that is full blood work, starting with a CBC, a chemistry, a urinalysis is imperative. Please, please, please ask your vet to do a urinalysis. And in this case, I would also add on a, a gastrointestinal panel, uh, specifically a Texas A&M GI panel. This is going to evaluate, you know, for possible pancreatitis or, you know, uh, problems with the, the GI tracts, uh, absorptive or digestive abilities. So use that information. And, and if there's a medical problem, then, then, you know, liver problems, kidney problems, pancreatitis. These are all things that, that can be addressed through specific diets. Um, time to go to balanceit.com, time to, you know, get a nutritional consult with a board of nutritionists. Um, but ever, you know, I, I have seen, and this is, this is a piece of information I'd really like to relay to everyone, is I've seen this happen multiple times to where for some reason a pet his appetite was off or her appetite was off for a period of time. Maybe it was the summer, it was hot, I, you know, and, and they were just kind of struggling with their appetite. There was no real medical reason, but their appetite started to wane and, and this really stresses people out. And, and I know it stresses me out too. When we moved 
to Utah, um, all my dogs got some kind of GI bug and they, they, they had variable appetites, didn't want to eat, um, you know, had some, had some GI signs. And, and the thing that stressed me the most was just, you know, cause they're normally tremendous eaters, you know, I have to watch my fingers and make sure I have 10 of them when I'm done feeding them, you know, because they just like their food a lot. And I, it was really stressful and, and I failed at my own advice. I would get very just, you know, stressed and, and, and kind of get in their space and try to coax them to eat. And all that did is make them take a step away and they didn't, they didn't want to eat. Um, so if we're talking about one time or two times, you know, where they're not eating, just relax, just, just relax, you know, maybe put a little like low sodium chicken broth on their food. Just see, you know, if they just need a couple of days, if it's more than a couple of days where their appetite is off, please see your veterinarian. Don't wait more than a couple of days. I see that all the time, you know, where it's been weeks or months where their appetite has been off or poor and, <clears throat> And, and people will ask me like, I would have came in sooner. Is there more, you know, could we have done things differently? And the answer is, the honest answer is yes. So if it's if it's more than a couple of days, please see your vet. Um, if you can't find a medical reason with it, I've seen this happen um, where it's a behavioral thing, where they get so stressed that mom and dad, you know, so concerned at mom and dad's stress that they think there must be something wrong with the food and they're not going to eat it. I've had several patients where you've done fairly large workups, found nothing medically. I've sent the pet to, you know, a behavioralist. Now, same behavioralist, there's even fewer behavioralists. And the same thing, board certified behavioralist, same process, veterinarian who did a residency. There's, I think I read that there's 88 behavioralists in the country right now. So you may not have one in your state, but they have a very good online presence. Um, so go, it's a dacvb.org that you can go to and you can get a, a I've, I've found a couple of places at least that you can get virtual consults and the last, same thing, very extensive appointment. Their appointments are usually not inexpensive, you know, because they're spending a lot of time and a lot of follow up, you know, so, um, so be prepared, but I've seen dogs that just would need and then send them to the behavioralist and they immediately, they want a video, they want to see what's going on and they can just see the behavior, that this is a behavioral problem in a short amount of time. They give the owners things to, to correct that and they're, they're eating well. I had a wonderful little lab patient that, you know, labs, they eat no matter what. And I just couldn't figure out why this dog wouldn't eat. Finally sent him to the behavioralist and immediately, you know, they could see that it was just, a stressful situation and and that the owner got stressed and the dog just shut down and said i better i better not eat so um i think that's everything um i know that's a lot and i i still don't think i even like scratched the surface of this but I, i'm well if there are any specific areas that you want to talk about um, just let me know. Just subscribe and like to this channel, to this YouTube channel, if you, if you don't mind. And anytime there's a new video, you'll get a notification. And then we'll do some live, live videos coming up soon. And you can ask questions, and I'll answer your questions, you know, live. But um, well, thank you so much. I'm new at this. Um, it, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll keep doing these, and I hope you guys are getting a lot out of them. So, thanks for joining, and take care. Thank you.